Luke chapter 22. Luke in chapter 22, that's the uh, New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book of the New Testament. It's one of the Gospels of Christ. And just before I I, I start talking about it, I just want to say thank you, church, for your Christmas uh, gift to us. It was the perfect size and color. A check. Amen. <laughs> and uh, it's fended real. It's fit real nice. And I want to say thank you. Uh, we don't expect that. We're always blessed when you when we receive gifts from you. And I want to say thank you. Uh, it, it, we, we used it on our vacation and it made it uh, a little more fun for us. And so I want to pre- I want to say thank you uh, to our church for that and let you know it's not unnoted. And uh, I could write a, a note and put it on the back table, or I can just say it to you all. Thank you. All right. All right, well, we're still, uh, this is sermon, just so everybody knows, this is sermon number 107 in the book of Luke. We will finish it eventually, I promise. I've been saying that since like 2020, and uh, that hasn't happened. But we'll finish it eventually, I promise. Uh, but this is uh, Tuesday of the Resurrection Week. Okay, so just kind of timeline-wise. Uh, Sunday, Jesus rode into uh, Jerusalem on a colt, a donkey, a young donkey that had never been ro- ridden, and that was called the Triumphal Entry. That's why they call it Palm Sunday, or it's called Palm Sunday because they threw palm leaves in front of him and their clothes in front of him, and everybody cheered, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so Jesus came in Sunday, Hosanna, Hosanna. He prayed that night in, the, in, in what we know as the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Monday, he comes in, clears the temple out, starts flipping tables and whipping people, or slashing, what is it, slashing the whip? I don't know. Don't ask me. I'm not Indiana Jones. I'm just Stephen Jones, okay? Uh, Anyways, he's whipping people and and clearing the temple out of all these wicked people. And then he begins to preach and teach. All day Monday, then he goes, he gets a little bit of rest. He prays again. Tuesday, he comes into the temple and starts doing it all over again. And the Pharisees come and the Sadducees come. And basically anybody that had an issue with Jesus came and tried to trip him up. And he answered every single one of their questions. And and really, he kind of got them all caught up. And none of them were able to stump him. And so then, uh, Tuesday afternoon or so, he sends a couple of disciples to go procure the upper room and get the, the feast of the unleavened bread, the Passover feast ready. And so they went and they had Passover and that's where they had the first Lord's Supper. What we do, the Lord's Supper, they started, it was instituted on a Tuesday night. By the way, that's why I like to do it on a Tuesday night, among other reasons. It was done on a Tuesday night. And then he continued to teach his disciples. By the way, in the upper room is when he would have washed the disciples' feet. Something that's very popular. People know about that. Uh, is when he, t- he taught some of the most incredible things in the upper room. And so uh, we've been to the upper room. Jesus has warned the disciples that now things are changing. Things are going to be different. That's what we covered uh, just before Christmas. Things are going to be different. They needed to have their, their, their bug out bag, if you will. They needed their sword. They needed to be ready for a spiritual battle because it was about to change. And then they leave the upper room. And that's where we're at today in our passage. Uh, Luke chapter 22. And we'll start reading verse number 39. I ask if you're able, please stand in honor of God's word if you're able. And, uh, we, and we'll read the passage together. Verse 39, follow along as I read. It says this. And he came out. And went, that's came out of the upper room. So he came out and went as he was wont to to the Mount of Olives. Basically that word want as he was, as he normally did. This was his custom. It was not unnatural for Jesus to go to the Mount of Olives to pray. And his disciples also followed him. Verse 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast And kneeled down and prayed, saying, verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's literal. He's bleeding from his face. Sweating blood from his face. We'll explain that later. And when he, and when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to get in your word once again. Lord, we do ask that you would 
empower this time, Lord. I ask that you'd open up the hearts of the people here today. If there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, that isn't 100% sure that if they die today that they go to heaven, I ask that you'd use this message and your Holy Spirit to convict their hearts of their need for salvation and give them the courage to get that settled today. Lord, for those that are saved, Lord, open up our hearts to the truth of this word. I know for sure that none of us pray as we should. None of us are as faithful as we should. Many of us are falling asleep on the job. So help us with this message. Lord, be with me as I preach it. Empty me of self and with the Holy Spirit. Speak through me to your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks for standing. The title of the message this morning, Falling Asleep on the Job. Falling asleep on the job. Uh, the first summer after Holly and I got married, I decided I would try to make some extra money for us, knowing that we had school bills to pay. And so I got a second job. So I worked my lumberyard job six days a week. And then I got a second job uh, working security at the church we went to. They big church, you know, a couple thousand people. So they like to have security every night. And uh, it was a pretty cush job, I'm not going to lie. Now, it was minimum wage, but I did literally nothing. I mean, I, I, I drove around a van. I'd drive a van around, and then three times a night, at like midnight, or, uh, midnight, like two in the morning, and like six in the morning, I'd go walk through the church. Or Yeah, I'd walk through the church, and it, it had a basement and then three floors. So it, that was a good walk, but I didn't do anything. And uh, they gave me a big flashlight, so I felt impressive. And <laughs> uh, but I, I got that job and I worked it two days a week or two nights a week and I, I worked them back to back nights. So for those two days, I went to work for about 10 to 12 hours a day at the lumber yard. I'd sleep for about three hours and then I'd go work all night and then I'd do it again the next day. So for two days, I might sleep about six hours maybe and I'd work a lot of hours. And so I found the hardest thing about the security job while it was cush was staying awake. Anybody been there with me? There's, it's easy to fall asleep at certain times. In fact, some of y'all are going to fall asleep during this message. If you sit down and you get still long enough, it's easy to fall asleep. And, and so what I would do is I'd get in the van and I'd have my laptop and, and I'd watch movies on my laptop. And I would, I would try to read books, which was the worst thing to do. I, at 2 in the morning, reading a book, is, it's, it's going to put you right to sleep. At least it does for me. I would try all these things just trying to stay awake. I know I've shared this story, but it's worth telling it again. I, I had a co-worker uh, named Tanner back when I worked at the lumber yard who uh, he struggled to stay awake so bad that he would during the day, middle of the day, he'd just disappear. He'd go to a back warehouse, a back barn where we'd keep tons and tons of OSB, stacks of OSB. Just, uh, it's, like, it's like plywood, comes in four, four by eight sheets and it'd be a stack that was about this tall. We'd stack them up real high and he'd climb up there like a little monkey and he'd go to sleep. <laughs> at least he did that till he was caught and then he was fired. <laughs> Not necessarily good for our, our school's uh, reputation as well because he was a college student at Heartland with me. <laughs> Nothing like being a Bible college student getting fired for sleeping on the job. In our passage, though, we have the disciples falling asleep on the job. So look back with me, and uh, right before we get back into the passage, let me say this. Uh, this account is also covered in Matthew and Mark. So again, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, first four, by, first four books of the New Testament. They are all about Jesus Christ. They're known as the four Gospels. Uh, and they all give different perspectives of the same stories. They never contradict. You just get different details from different ones. Uh, let me put it this way. Have you ever got just one person's side of a story? Yeah. That kind of skews your thought of that one side, right? So this gives you multiple angles of the same story. So this is covered in Mark and Matthew. And so if I say something that you don't see directly here in Luke chapter 22, it's probably because I got it out of Matthew chapter 26, which covered it in depth, okay? So just understand, Matthew 26 covered it. If I say something, you say, I don't remember seeing that. Go to Matthew 26, not dirt while I'm preaching, after I'm done preaching, and, and you'll find it there. Okay, so uh, let, let's get into this passage. Let me just kind of, if you'll give me the grace, I'm just going to try to paint a picture of this scene, if you will. So verse 39 gives us a lot of good information. Jesus is going to the Mount of Olives, which at the base is the Garden of Gethsemane. That's, what, that's where the Garden of Gethsemane is, is at the base of the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane, that word means oil press. How, how interesting that the place where, and it's because there was all the olives, obviously, Mount of Olives. I didn't have to go to Bible college to figure that one out. Uh, Mount of Olives obviously has a lot of olives in there. The Garden of Gethsemane was known as the press because I, I guess they did a lot of olive pressing there. But it happens to be in this place that Jesus is put under the most pressure in, that he's ever been in in his, in his earthly life. And so uh, Jesus was known for going there. He regularly went to this place. At least these last few days, he's been visiting this place. And he was there so often that Judas, 
the betrayer who's already left the disciples could predict that that's where he was going to be and that's where he shows up. We'll cover that next week. And so he was there very often. So he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And what, what we don't see in Luke, but that you'll find out in uh, Matthew's account, is that as he crossed Kidron, uh, as he crossed the, the, the river Kidron, he actually pulled aside three of his most prized pupils. Can I say it like that? Peter, James, and John. These are the inner, this is the inner circle of disciples. There is, this is the close of the close. These are the, the, the disciple whom he loved. That's John. This is James who will become the first pastor after Jesus of the church Jesus starts. This is Peter who is the mouthpiece of Pentecost. These are the guys. I mean, if they lived in modern day today, these would be the guys I would be doing my best to bother to try to get in to come and preach. There's, there's guys like that, by the way, I, that I'm like, hey, when it, you know, I, I was bugging Park Sutton. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm booked up till 2025. I'm like, seriously? All right, put me down for 2025. I'm talking to Dean Herring. He's like, I'm booked out for a while. I was like, how's 2025? He's like, I might could squeeze you in. Let me see if I can fit in. I'm like, oh, come on. You know, so these are those guys. These are the big name guys. These are guys that, that, that everyone would know their name. So Jesus pulls them aside, his prized pupils, the, the, the ones that he's poured most of his time and energy into. He pulls them aside. And what we don't read in Luke is that he pours his heart out to them. He, he, he comes to them in sorrow. He lets them know what's happening and he, and he's, and he's broken and he's sad. And, and imagine, and, and you may not be able to see it when you read the gospels, but I promise you because Jesus was God in the flesh that Jesus embodied joy. He was a joyful man. He, he was a gentle, good, long suffering, patient, loving, kind man. And I imagine at this point, it was like they'd never seen Jesus like this. He's as broken as he's ever been. As he's under the weight and the pressure of knowing what's going to happen. So he encourages them in Matthew's account to watch and pray with him for an hour. And then he leaves. About a stone's throw away. Now, uh, I don't know whose stone or whose arm is throwing the stone. Because if it's like, you know, if it's Nathan, it's to the door. If it's me, it's to Ace. <laughs> I actually think he probably could still throw farther than me, even though he's a little older than me. Um, but anyways, it's a stone's throw away. And so they go a stone's throw. He goes a th stone's throw away. And there he begins to pour his heart out to God. And here's what he says in verse number 42. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He's God. Je Hang on, we got to get this. Jesus is God. If you don't believe that, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try to convince you later. But Jesus is God. God in the flesh. He understands everything that's about to happen to him. He is hours from some sham trials. What do I mean by sham trials? Where he doesn't actually get a fair trial. Where, 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 where people try to accuse him of things that he never did. Where people try to uh, lie about him. Where he's passed off from here to there. Sham trials. He knows that. So as he's sitting there praying. By the way, can I just pause and say. Jesus didn't ask the disciples to do anything he wasn't willing to do. Amen. Parents, can I just encourage you? Don't ask your children to do anything you aren't willing to do. By golly, my kid needs to obey me. And all he does is hear how you disobeyed your boss today and you're proud of it. And how you disobey the authority that the government has put on it. Well, bless God, that's the government. Well, bless God, the Bible says that we're supposed to, to fall under and obey all the authorities that are put over us. That are put over us. That's including government. So, so don't expect your child to obey if you're not willing to obey. Well, bless God, my kid ought to read his Bible. When's the last time you read your Bible? Well, my kid needs to memorize these verses for Sunday school. Well, how about you memorize the verses? I inevitably end up memorizing all of Izzy and Braxton's verses. I put them to song, and then they're stuck. And then we sing them some more. And if I, if I encourage my kids to read their Bible, I ought to read my Bible. If I encourage my kids to dress a certain way, I, I, I should dress a certain way. Jesus said, I need you to pray. I need you to watch and pray for an hour, and he did it. He didn't say, I want you to watch and pray. I'm going to go take a nap. By the way, the other eight disciples that he didn't pull were probably taking a nap. The, car the carnal side of me knows that's where I would have been. Oh, thank goodness. He didn't pick me. I can go to sleep now. Because <laughs> remember, it's about, or I didn't tell you this. It's about 10, 10 a, or p.m. to about 12 a.m., somewhere in that time frame, okay? That's where we are. So it's late at night. Okay, late for some of us. I go to bed like you know, 9. Some of you are like, oh, 10, 12. I'm still up doing all this. I don't get up till noon. And teach their own. I'm not judging. Uh, so it's about 10. So it's late. And so Jesus is praying. He's pouring out his heart, heart to God. And he understands everything that is about to, to happen to him. He knows exactly the person, or people I should say, plural, that are going to slap him in the face while they blindfold him. He knows exactly what it's going to feel like. 
my wife and I were talking in, in, about a punch in the face, and I said, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't know why, but that's just one of those things that sends me on, off my rocker. I'll, I'll tolerate a lot, but once you punch me in the face, it's one of those that just enrages me instantly. And Jesus knew exactly who was going to slap him in the face and, and mock him why they did it. Jesus knew exactly who was going to rip his beard from his face. I've never had any of my beard plucked from my face. Now Brody is trying very avidly to get this out. He's tried. At one year old, he's getting a pretty good, nice pool too. I'm like, all right, son, chill out. But I've never had my beard literally ripped off my face where skin and flesh would come with it. And Jesus knows that's coming. Jesus knows that he's going to go and be put against a post and whipped with a cat of nine tails. And I know I've told you about this, but, but just bear with me again. The cat of nine tails, each, each guy had his own and each one was like personalized. It's like their signature. So some guys would take glass and they'd tie it at the ends of it. Some guys would use sharpened bones. Some guys would use pieces of clay. And as the, it's known as a cat of nine tails because it had nine frays off the base of it. And so nine of those whips would lash across Jesus. But they said that wasn't really the worst part of the cat of nine tails. The worst part of the cat of nine tails was that it would wrap around the abdomen and it would grab flesh. And, they, and as, that, as that Roman soldier would rip it back out, it would pull flesh with it to the point that sometimes intestines would fall out. And, it, and, and historians say that a, a talented Roman soldier who was versed in this knew exactly how to take a man right to the brink of death and then stop and that's what they did to Jesus and Jesus knew every feeling that that was going to be he knew what it was going to feel like as he had the cross put on his shoulder and as he tried with all of his might to get it to where it was supposed to go but literally could not physically get it there because of all the beatings he knew that the mocking and the, and the people spitting on him that's another thing that man spitting on somebody is just is, 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 is awful it's one of the most awful things I can think of it's so disgusting when when you know what's inside of somebody's mouth and, and to think that Jesus was literally soaked in spit and, and mocked and then he knew what it was going to feel like as, as no, they wouldn't be kind and just tie his wrist and tie his ankles to the cross. No, instead, they, they decided they were going to use what, what we would call like railroad spikes. I mean, big nails and they would each drive and I, I don't care how good they are. You're not driving a railroad spike into a solid piece of wood in one strike. So he knew each time that hammer would hit that nail and it pierce into his hand and into his feet he knew exactly what it would feel like as they would lift that cross and the way they got the cross standing was they already would have about a five foot hole dug and they would lift that cross and just let it drop so he would drop five feet nailed to this cross boom to the floor and at that point uh, historians say every joint in your body would dislocate your body physically couldn't stand it and the way they had you hung was perfect to dislocate most most joints in your body. He knew what it was going to feel like. You understand? He knew what it was going to feel like as he struggled for every breath, gargling on his own blood, that he would have to try with all of the might that he had left, hanging there naked in front of everybody. He'd have to try with all of his might to pull his body up because in the position of the cross, it would constrain your lungs so that you could not get a breath. So you would literally have to lift yourself up to actually catch a slight and go back down. He knew all of that. Most importantly, he knew that God the Father was going to turn his back on the sin that Jesus took upon himself. He knew every bit of that was coming. As he pondered those things, I mean, I, I know we really can't understand this. Have, have you ever, I'll try to help you, have you ever like had that go through surgery? Kind of like whatever the surgery was and you're kind of nervous about it? Thinking of all that, even if it's minor, you're still thinking, what about the things that can go wrong? You know what I mean? Like, oh, what? You, I, I might not this or I might not that. And, and, and you can kind of stress about all that might happen during the surgery. Jesus didn't have to stress about what might happen during this crucifixion time. He knew exactly every step of the way what would happen. And so he begged God, if there is another way, if you will do it another way, please, God, pass this cup from me. But nonetheless, he says, it's not my will, God. It's your will. I want your will to be done. By the way, can I just take a minute to just talk about authority real quick? Jesus was equal with God, and yet he was subservient and submissive to God. Because being submissive does not mean you're lesser than. It means you're following God's order of things. Amen. I'll let you apply that to yourself. <laughs> so Jesus pours out his heart to God, and then this is a, a true medical term. The condition is called, I'm going to mispronounce it probably, Hematodrosis. Hematodrosis. 
what happens is you get under such extreme pressure that the blood vessels in your face literally burst, causing blood to mingle with your sweat and come out of your pores. It wasn't that Jesus, it wasn't that, oh, the writers were trying to explain how thick the, the sweat was. No, no. It was literally the blood vessels in Jesus' face. He was so stressed that they began to burst. And so dr- blood and sweat was pouring from his face. So much so that, an, that God sent an angel, knowing no man and no woman could comfort him in this kind of situation. So God sent an angel down from heaven. And I don't know what he did to strengthen him. But in my mind, the only thing that makes sense is that this angel kind of put his arm around Jesus. I don't know. Make up whatever you want because the Bible doesn't say. How, what, did, he didn't pick him up. I know that because he, he kept praying. So we know he didn't get picked up. But I, in my mind, for some reason, I just imagine this literal angel all of a sudden, boom, manifesting and like kind of wrapping his arms around Jesus as if to say, I understand. We're with you. Because no doubt, every angel in heaven watched every moment of what was taking place. As God the Son went through the darkest hour in in mankind's history. Jesus continues to pray and then he gets up. He comes over. Back to where the disciples were. And they're sleeping. Now can I just take a moment to say. How much that would compound. He knew they were going to do it. But how much that compounds the stress you're under. We really can't understand the stress that Jesus was under at this point. Oh well. Well. Pastor, I've seen Passion of the Christ, and I've seen this. You think Hollywood could accurately depict exactly what happened to Jesus Christ on that night? I'm going to argue that it can't. None of us could understand. And as he comes to his disciples, there they are sleeping. And he says says to them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Don't forget, Jesus has just warned Peter and the rest of the disciples that Satan is looking to sift them as wheat. It was just... Not even probably an hour ago that he warned, or now that he's been praying for an hour, I guess it would have been about two hours ago. It was not even two hours ago that Jesus warned Peter, Simon, Satan has sought to sift you as wheat, meaning he's looking to throw you off. He's going to tempt you to betray me. He's going to tempt you to leave me. He's going to tempt you to forsake me. And he's going to do it to all of you. So he's telling them, you need to pray. You need to pray that that doesn't happen. You need to ask God for strength. And so he, he encourages them again. Matthew's account tells us that Jesus had to do this multiple times. He'd show up, wake him up, go to pray, and then fall asleep. Now, by the way, I, 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 I don't want to act like these guys hated Jesus or something. That they were mean and vindictive and didn't care. I imagine them doing a lot like what I did in the van of sec- doing security. All right, I got this. No, I'm, gonna, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> Allegedly doing that. Nobody can prove it. Nobody was there. There's no cameras. I was awake and vigilant the whole time. Nobody ever broke into the church on my watch. I imagine them in good with with the with the right spirit and right heart, thinking, "I've got this. I'll stay awake." And then they begin to pray and fall asleep. It, to 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 paint a, a broader picture, Matthew's account tells us that he asked Peter this. Could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not watch? Because that's what Jesus asked him in Matthew's account. He told him, watch and pray. Watch means pay attention to what's going on and pray about the situation. And he says, you couldn't even watch with me for just one hour, Peter? Eventually, in verse 46, we don't see it here. But uh, I'm sorry, in Matthew's account, we don't see it here. But in Matthew's account, he lets them just sleep. He says, sleep on for the time of... It has come for me to be betrayed, basically. So he says, finally, the third time he shows up, he says, just sleep, guys. Just sleep. Well, that, that, that's the passage. That's the passage. Well, what can we learn from it? Try to make this fast. Let's see. Three things I want to point out from the passage. Three main principles I want to help us with. Number one, Jesus didn't ask anything unreasonable. Jesus didn't ask anything unreasonable. What Jesus told the disciples to do was pray. Physically speaking, how hard is praying? Physically speaking, it's not. I've known cripples that can pray. I've known old people that couldn't even get out to church anymore, but you knew that they were at home in their chair praying. Because praying is not something that is physically demanding. How long did he ask them to pray? One hour. In In the grand scheme of things, is one hour that long? There's 168 hours in a week. Is an hour really that long? You say, well, I mean, it's an hour, Pastor. Well, how about, how about you just... Track some time how long you spent on your phone, on social media, or on television this week. Tell me if you can't add up an hour somewhere. 
Tell me if there's not an hour to be had. Because the average American, and this is an old statistic. I haven't looked up what it is now because I'm betting it's worse. The average American used to, at least in, uh, a couple of years ago, spent seven hours a day on a, on a screen. Seven hours a day. That's almost a third of the day. And I'm betting now it's probably more than that because, um, I mean, now they're having to come up with work. Places of business are having to come up with ways to block cell phone service and internet and stuff so that their employees will get off their phone and just work. Because everybody's so hooked on those. The, the, the reality of it is, Jesus didn't ask them to do anything unrealistic or unreasonable. Well, I mean, they were tired. You said it was like 10 o'clock at night. And Jesus wasn't tired? Jesus has been up probably before them. Because don't forget, Jesus always prayed late in the evening. He'd get up and he'd pray early in the morning. He got less sleep than most people did. And then he didn't get to sit down and rest. He was the one that was preaching and teaching and dealing with the While they were sitting there enjoying themselves, he was the one doing work all day. Oh, sure, Peter and John. Well, Peter and John, they had to go get the, the upper room ready. Well, bless God, I'm so sorry they had a couple hours of work. But Jesus was just as tired. He didn't ask him to do anything unreasonable here. By the way, if you struggle to, fall, to stay awake in a certain position, change positions. The way I did security back when I was, that first year we were married, was I would do it Friday night and Saturday night. That meant I got maybe an hour, two hours of sleep, and then I'd go to church on Sunday. So here's how I'd sit. You may not be able to see it, but I would keep one leg up. I'd sit and I'd keep one leg floating. I'd be, I, don't, I don't chew gum because I dislocated my jaw a long time ago and it hurts, but I would chew gum. I'd sit there and just, why? Because I knew if I put that foot down, I'm going to sleep. I'm out. If you have trouble staying awake, maybe change your position. They could have changed their position. It wasn't unreasonable. Biblically speaking, we are also commanded to pray. Luke 18, 1 says this, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray and not faint. Colossians 4, 2, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. There's nothing unreasonable about Jesus telling us to pray. We have the time. Well, Pastor, I, you may have the time because you work like, what, five hours a week? Uh, but I don't have the time to pray. Well, what is keeping you so busy that you're willing to disobey God? Because it's a command from Him. It's a command from Him. It's reasonable, it's reasonable to say, as a born-again believer, you ought to be praying daily. And I'm not just talking about for your food. Lord, bless this food and, uh, and let all the people in the world get saved. Amen. I'm talking serious, conscious, prayerless type prayers. Next, number two. Jesus wanted them to have every advantage possible to face the day ahead of them. Jesus wanted them to have every advantage possible to face the day ahead of him. Jesus knew and even warned them about what they were soon to face. He wanted them to pray that they would overcome the temptation that he warned them of. Jesus wanted them to get victory over their temptations. Is it possible? Bear with me here. Is it possible that if Peter... James and John had actually prayed for that hour that they would not be overcome by temptation, that they might have not been overcome by temptation just in like a few hours, less than an hour, when Judas shows up. By the way, don't worry. They're all excited for a, for a physical fight. Oh man, they're geared up for a physical fight. Lord, should we, should we slay them? You want me to throw down with them, God? They're, they're ready. And yet you couldn't stay awake 30 minutes ago to pray. And then when Jesus is taken... Peter follows afar off, and James and John are nowhere to be found at the moment. And the rest aren't either. Is it possible that if they had done what Jesus told them to do, God would have given them the strength to overcome temptation? Is that possible? How often, I wonder, are we overcome by sin and temptation simply because we did not get with God in the morning? No, God understands exactly what your day is going to look like. He understands what your boss is going to say to you. He understands what your wife is going to say to you. He understands what your husband's going to do that's ignorant and frustrating because that's what husbands do. We ignorant and we're ignorant and we frustrate. He understands when your kids are going to be a handful. Not just a handful, but a handful. You know, it's like, what happened to you last night? I'm going to go get a Catholic priest, get this demon out of you real quick. He understands those things. And so God, he wants you to read your Bible every day to prepare you. And he wants you to pray every day to prepare you 
for the temptations that you are going to face. And how often we fail when the temptation comes. Because we didn't ask God to help. I'm going to use this illustration multiple times a day. But say you have a pornography problem. You say, I don't want to do it anymore. And you're doing your best to quit. And you don't read your Bible that day. Well, then when that temptation comes, when that alone time comes, or when, it, when, when the thought hits your brain, you, you are lacking the power of God that he intended you to have to not do that. And you can, you can insert anything you want to that. You have a smoking problem. You have a drinking problem. You have a lustful problem. You have a uh, gossiping problem. You have a anger problem. Any of those, insert that. You are lacking the power of God because you did not read your Bible and pray. Therefore, you are falling into temptation, which God knew you were going to face. Yeah, I got, I, I could tell y'all didn't like that one, so we'll move on. Okay, we won't move on. I got to say this. You realize that Jesus as our intercessor has made it possible to commune with God whenever and wherever we want for however long we want. I want you to understand this. This is important. The Old Testament saints, the men we look up to like David and, and like Solomon, those men would have done anything to have the access to the throne of God that we have because they didn't. What do you mean? Well, they had a tabernacle and they had a temple and it had an innermost part, a sacred holy of holies part that only a priest, the high priest was allowed to go in and he had to be washed and cleansed. And he was the only one that got to commune with God that way. It was a different kind of communion because they didn't have Jesus Christ. You say, well, they can still pray and stuff. And I see that. Yes, but they understood they were distinctly away from God and could not get to him. They, they would die for what we have in the New Testament. Okay, lastly, Jesus knew there was work to be done. Jesus not only saw his own death, but the events after his death. And he understood that there was a lot of work to be done, but the disciples all slept. There's still a lot of work to be done today. I'm wondering, have we fallen asleep on the job, church? Well, what do you mean, pastor? Well, how about worldwide missions? Worldwide missions. There are billions of people in the world right now on their way to hell. Are you watching and praying? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, you heard me when I prayed for my meal. I said, thank you, Lord, for the food and help everyone in the world get saved. You heard me. You know, I mean, serious, thoughtful prayer. Maybe for our missionaries, particularly. And the souls they're trying to reach. Do you realize there's 1.4 billion, not, not million, billion people in China. Let me try to put that in perspective. And, and this is open. I'm going to let you answer this. Who can tell me how many days a million seconds is? Million seconds. One million seconds. How many days is that? Anyone? Know? You can guess. There's no wrong answer. Well, there's wrong answers, but I'm not. It's a guess. Anybody want to guess? No? Nobody? It's a guess. How many days? Don't try to do the math. Nathan's over here like, I'm going to get this. It's 11. 11 days is a million seconds. But to put in perspective, billion. Here, let me help you. Guess how many days are in a, are in a, million, are a billion seconds? 31 years. 31 years. Do you see the drastic difference between a million and a billion? We have 330-something million people in America. And there are churches all over the place trying to reach these people. China's got 1.4 Billion, and I can only name three missionaries that I know of in China. Do you pray for them? By the way, if you can't name our missionaries by name, that's a pretty strong indication you're not praying for them. I hope that, I hope that as the pastor, I could close my eyes and name each and every one of our missionaries and where they serve. I hope so. But I'm not the only one that should be able to do that. Why? Because we're falling asleep on the job if we're not praying for our missionaries. And, and they give us prayer requests. And they have things and hurts and needs that need to be dealt with. How about we falling asleep and raising our children? You know, our children are going to have to face things we never had to face. And I know every generation probably says this, but I never had to grow up wondering, am I really supposed to be a boy? That was never something that was thought. Literally never thought I was a boy. I didn't wear pink. Amen. Sorry, I'll amen myself. That, that's a personal thing. I didn't wear pink. Except to that one wedding that my friend made me wear. I still hate him for it. 
And then the hat that I wore one time that Tristan has a picture of, but that was only for a second, I swear. I never had to debate if I was, if I was a boy. I never had to wonder uh, about transgenderism and, and, and fluidity and, and all the things that they're facing. I didn't have to face social media as an elementary and middle school kid. Now I'm young enough that social media started coming around towards the end of high school, but I never even had it. And yet our kids are going to have to face all of those things. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to live in a world that is doing all of those things. Are you praying for them? Are you praying for their relationship with God? Are you praying for growth in the Lord, for their future spouse? Oh, well, my, my kid, uh, you know, what, they're never going to get married? I already said in Sunday school, I already pray for the man that's going to come out calling for Izzy. I pray that he's faster than a 38 special, which I don't think he is. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I do pray for them. Do you know who your friends are? Remember, your friends are influencing them. Do you know what music is on their phone? Do you know what they want to, or who they want to date or who are they trying to date? Are you watching and praying for them? By the way, parents, let me encourage you. If your kid's got a cell phone, randomly just grab that phone and go through it. <sighs> Pastor. Pastor. That's an invasion of privacy. What privacy? It's your phone in your home, in your internet, in your room. Your kid, yeah. What privacy? You want privacy? Move out and pay your own phone bill. And I'll stop grabbing it. But till then, and I will let my kids know whenever the day comes, I'm dreading the day when they are going to have to have cell phones. This is not your cell phone. This is dad's cell phone. I am lending it to you. Dad has the right to take it back anytime I want. If you abuse or misuse this privilege, you no longer get the privilege because it's mine. You say, well, that's just cruel parenting. No, I, I'm going to try to do my very best to protect my children. I want to know what music they're listening to. I want to know who their closest friends are. I want to know what they're posting. I want to know, I want to know everything. Amen. I never want my sons to have to struggle through a pornography addiction. Amen. And I, it's not going to be because I didn't try everything in my power to make sure it didn't happen. They're going to have to jump through some hoops if it ever happens. But I want to be able to stand before the Lord and say, I did my very best to protect my sons. Amen. I did my very best to protect my daughters. And if you think you're invading their privacy by doing so, then you're failing as a parent. They don't get privacy. They don't get privacy. They're your children. God gave them to you to nurture and raise in the admonition of the Lord. Amen. Okay, that went way longer than I was supposed to go. Here we go. By the way, I did say this. I hope you pray for your own children more than I pray for your children. I hope so. Amen. Well, my children are grown, Pastor. Well, fine. Then your grandchildren. Because guess what? They're facing the same kind of stuff. Do you pray for our church? Are you watching and praying? I often wonder what would happen if daily every member of Pete New Baptist Church begged the Lord to empower our church. If, 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 every, if every week you guys were praying for my sermons hard, as hard as I was, and praying for visitors as much as I was, and praying for souls saved, and more than I am, what would happen if all of us were doing that? I don't know, but I, I, I'd venture to say... We wouldn't, we wouldn't understand all that was happening. We'd go, this is amazing. This is blowing us away. Amen. Are you watching and praying for your spouse? Do you daily beg God to help them grow spiritually, to face the difficulties of the day? Do you pray for your husband to lead your family spiritually? Do you pray for your wife to fulfill her role as a wife and a mother with grace and passion? Oh, so many will complain about their spouse all day long. They get to work and gripe this. Mama, all that ball and change. <laughs> and I don't know why when I think of people complaining about their husband, that's what I hear. <laughs> and wives calling up their friends. All he ever done. Well, why don't you stop complaining about them and why don't you start praying for them? By the way, you married him. Not like nobody put a gun to your head. Why did you marry him? Stupid? Sorry. If you don't like him. Okay. Okay. I got to hurry. Sadly, I believe not just us, but I'm going to preach specifically to Peepee Baptist Church because that's the church I pastor. We've fallen asleep on the job. Our Savior poured drops of blood from his face praying, and we can't be bothered to give 10 minutes to it every day. 10 minutes. I bet it doesn't happen. Sadly. Don't blame the politicians. Don't blame the left. Don't blame this generation or that generation. America is in the state it is in because Americans have forsaken the most powerful weapon we have, prayer. You want to see cha things change? Then you change. You wake up and pray. Watch and pray. Make prayer an important priority in your life. More important than television or your phone or your social media. More important than your hobbies or your games. 
more important than exercise or whatever you may think is important. Make prayer a priority and don't stop sleeping on the job. I realized that if I prayed as much as I worked out, I'd be praying easily over an hour a day. Easily. Because I usually easily work out more than an hour a day. In fact, I usually can't squeeze it under an hour sometimes. And somehow, even as a pastor, I struggle to give 10, 20, 30 minutes to prayer. Why? Because I have priorities for health and fitness. I have priorities for fun with my kids and sports and this and that. I don't have a priority for prayer. This message is just as much for me as it is for you. Let me end by saying this. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, we'd love to show you from the Bible the prayer that you need to pray and be saved. The Bible lays out very clearly how, how someone can know. Because the Bible says you can know that you have eternal life. You can know, you could leave here today knowing without a shadow of a doubt that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. And we would love to show you from the Bible. So how's that going to work? Well, we're about to have an invitation time. And what that is, it's literally what it sounds like. It's an invitation. Everybody's head's going to be bowed. Everybody's eyes are going to be closed. It's a private time. And if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, we just invite you to come say, I would like to talk to somebody. And I'll get you sat down in, a, in one of these offices. It'll be private. We don't look to embarrass anybody. If you need somebody to come with you to make you comfortable, we want you to be comfortable. Bring whoever you want. And we'll just show you from the Bible. Not Peak View Baptist way. We're not trying to. We're not pushing Peak View Baptist Church on anybody. We're not. We're not pushing uh, Pastor Stevens way. We just want to show you from the Bible what it says. Amen. You say, well, if I trust Jesus as my personal Savior, you're going to expect me to stick around. I don't care if you walk out these doors and never come back. If I, if you really trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, that'd be a hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Say, well, I, I don't. I don't want to get baptized. You don't have to get baptized to be saved. You might want to after you get saved, but you don't have to to be saved. Well, I don't want to join your church. You don't have to join our church. Salvation is the first step to knowing Jesus Christ your personal Savior. It's how you know Jesus Christ your personal Savior. And that is the most important thing. That's what guarantees you eternal life. Not baptism, not works, not repentance, not prayers. Now, repentance is part of salvation, but I'm saying you can't just be sorry for your sins and expect that to get you there. Not praying to a, a, a asking a priest or a pastor to pray for you. None of that will do it, but God can do it. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll have our...